This lecture is presented by John Moffat of Open Tuition. For other free lectures, visit opentuition.com. Okay, we're going to uh, work through uh, the paper F5 exam from June 2015. So uh, make sure you've um, got it in front of you that you've downloaded it from the ACCA website. Um, and first of all, I'm going to go through section A. Oops. Uh, the multiple choice questions. So let's start working through them. Um, question one. It says, um, always look at the, the bold bit first. Um, check what it is you're after before you waste too much time reading the question. But it says, what is the expected annual residual income of the initial investment? So it's obviously a residual income question. And what it says is a division is considering investing in capital equipment costing 2.7 million. The useful economic life of the equipment is expected to be 50 years with no resale value. The forecast return on the initial investment is 15% per annum before depreciation. And the cost of capital is 7%. But well, remember for residual income, first of all, we need to know the, um, the profit, the accounting profit. And what's it going to be? Well, it says the return on the investment is excuse me, 15% per annum. And the uh, cost of the equipment was 2.7 million. So it's 15% of 2.7 million. So that gives us how much? 2.7 million. Uh, 405,000. But that's the profit before depreciation. We need the final accounting profit, the profit after depreciation. And so what's the depreciation going to be? Uh, the cost was 2.7 million. Uh, the useful life is 50 years. And so depreciation, 54,000. Uh, giving uh, a final profit here of uh, 351,000 per annum. For the residual income, we need to subtract the notional interest. And the interest, it says the cost of capital, 7%. Uh, the investment, 2.7 million. And so the notional interest, 189,000. Uh, which leaves us with a residual income. Oh dear, what's wrong with me? 351 minus 189. Residual income of 162,000. Uh, is that, yep, there we are. The answer is C. I appreciate I'm taking time here because I'm talking. And you may not think so, but I'm trying to show my workings neatly. Remember in the exam, it's got to be speed. You haven't t uh, time to think. Nobody's going to look at your workings. So don't waste time being pretty. Uh, it's as fast as you can. Um, well, I get the answer C, 162,000. Let's move on. Let's look at number two. There's quite a lot to read here. I don't know. I've said uh, if you looked at any of the other exams I've been through, Although I'm doing them in order here, um, then the, the, there's no confusion. In the exam, because of um, so much relies on speed, uh, do be prepared to jump around. If one looks as though there's too much to read, leave it. You can come back to it later. You know, later in the paper, there's some very short ones um, which you can get through very quickly. Anyway, number two, uh, which of the above are relevant to the decision? So it's a relevant costing question. And what does it say? It says the fruit company currently grows fruit which customers pick themselves from the fields before paying. EFCO is concerned that a large number of customers are eating some fruit while picking it and therefore not paying for it at all. As a result, it has to decide whether to hire staff to pick and package the fruit instead. The following costs have been identified. 
So there's their choice. That's the decision that, that, that they want to make. Uh, shall we allow people to carry on picking their own? Or um, shall we stop them picking their own uh, and hire staff? Uh, and they'll do the picking and packing. So which of these are relevant? First of all, number one, the total sales value of the fruit currently picked and paid for by the customers. Well, it is going to be relevant. You know, if, it, if they're picking it themselves, they'll pay one price. Presumably, um, if the firm does the picking for them, they'll have to pay a different price. But we'll have to look at the difference in the two prices. So number one is relevant. Number two, the cost of growing the fruit. Well, no, because whatever decision they make, whether people pick their own or whether um, we hire people to pick it, uh, it'll still cost the same to actually grow the fruit. That's not going to change. Number three, the cost of hiring staff to pick and package the fruit. Well, yes. Again, I'm sorry I keep repeating, but if people pick their own, we won't have that cost. If, on the other hand, uh, we are people, we will have the cost. So we will need to take that into account. And finally, number four, the total sales value of the fruit if it is picked and packaged by staff instead. Well, I mentioned that at the beginning. Uh, number one on that list, how much uh, are they paying when they pick it themselves? If we're trying to um, choose between these two alternatives, we'll also need to know how much uh, they'll have to pay if it's picked and packaged by staff instead. So in fact, it's everything except number two. So one, three, four. The answer is D. So I don't know, quite a bit to read, but it should be pretty straightforward, subject to the time it takes. Number three. Well, here's a very standard one. Which of the following statements describes standard, uh, target costing? Well, you've either learned target costing or you haven't. Uh, but rather than waste time, um, it's a standard definition and the answer is C. With target costing, we determine first the market price of the product, how much we expect to sell it for. We decide what profit margin we, will, we want. And we put the two together, subtract the profit margin, and there's the cost we're aiming for, the target cost. If you're at all unsure, obviously, watch our lectures. They go through everything, including there, uh, there is a chapter clearly on target costing. Over the page number four. Applying the decision criterion of minimax regret. How many sandwiches should the company decide to supply each day? So it's decision making under uncertainty. Just in minimax regret, you've either learnt the rule or you haven't. But let's read it. The mobile sandwich company prepares sandwiches which it delivers and sells to employees at local businesses each day. Demand varies between 325 and 400 sandwiches each day. So that's what's uncertain, the daily demand. And you can see in the table that's coming uh, down the side, the daily demand will either be 325, 350, 375 or 400. Uh, and incidentally, I'm not going to write up the whole table, but just so that it's clear what I'm trying to say, I'll just write a bit of it. The demand, which is in uncertain, 325, 350, 375, 400. As the day progresses, the price of sandwiches is reduced, and at the end of the day, any sandwiches not sold are thrown away. Um, we prepared a regret table, so the regret table's been done for us. Remember, again, not relevant here, but um, we normally do the profit table first, and then from that we prepare the regret table, but they've done that for us. And it shows the amount of profit each, uh, which would be forgone each day at each supply level, given the various daily levels of demand. Well, we've already said it's demand that's uncertain. 
Now the question said, we read it at the beginning, how many should we supply? So this is what we're deciding. And the question is, are we going to supply 325, 350, 375 or 400? And you've got all those figures there. Um, you know, just putting in one of the columns, the regret is zero, 36, 82. 142 and uh, again I said I'm not going to write up the whole table well the Minimax regret rule what we do is for each choice of action 325 or 350 and so on we say <coughs> what's the worst that can happen the worst that can happen these are regrets so is the maximum regret so if it's 325 the worst that can happen is this regret of 142. On the other hand, if we supply 350 a day, it's 21, 0, 40, 90. The worst that can happen is 90. If it's 375 a day, running down 82, 44, 0, 52. The worst, the maximum regret is 82. And finally, if it's 400 a day, uh, 120, 78, 30. the worst is regret of 120. To choose between those four, uh, the minimum of the maximum, what's the best of the worst? Uh, well, the best is the smallest, the minimax, it's 82. And so which course of action is that? It's 375. We'll supply 375 a day. The answer is C. As I said with the last question, but I, I won't keep saying it. Um, if you're at all unsure about any of these, I, I can't give a full lecture on Minimax Regret now. Go back to our lectures. All of them are covered um, in the free lectures for F5. Anyway, let's carry on number five. Again, a, what you might call a definition one. Which of the above statements is or are true? And we've two statements. The following statements have been made about transaction processing systems and executive information systems. Number one, a transaction processing system collects and records the transactions of an organization. Well, that is true. You know, that effectively the definition of a transaction processing. Um, it records the transactions. What about number two? An executive information system is a way of integrating the data from all operations into a single system. No, no, it's not integrating them. Um, the EIS, it allows the um, management to be able to access information in a way that's easy to understand uh, but it's not there to integrate the data from all uh, operations okay let's um, carry on with number six of the exam where are we uh, which of the above are required in order to calculate the break-even sales revenue for the company What's it say? The following information is available for a manufacturing company which produces multiple products. It's multiple products note. So, number one, the product mix ratio. Number two, the contribution to sales ratio for each product. Number three, the general fixed costs. And number four, the method of apportioning general fixed costs. Well, as I said earlier, I can't go through and teach the whole of multi-product cost volume profit analysis here. We've got lectures for it on the website. But what you need, you certainly need the general fixed costs, number three. Uh, and to get the break-even sales revenue, we divide by the CS ratio. But because there are multiple products, we need um, number two, the CS ratio for each product. And again, because it's multiple products, we need the product mix ratio. So we need those. Um, number one and two will give us the overall CS ratio. 
and then we can divide that into the general fixed costs. What we don't need is number four, uh, the method of apportioning general fixed costs, completely irrelevant uh, in this sort of situation. So it's one, two, and three. The answer is B. On with number seven. Which of the following, I, I, well, I hope this is an easy one in all respects. Not only is it very quick to read, you know, go for those. If you don't understand it, just guess an answer and get it out of the way. Uh, but also, uh, I think it, 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 the answer is almost forced on you. Which of the following is an external source of information? External, not information within the company. Um, A, the value of sales for each customer, that's internal. Uh, B, value of purchases for each supplier, that's internal. C, the prices of similar products analysed for each competitor company. Well, these are prices from other companies, that is external. The answer is C. Uh, in the exam, you don't, you don't need to waste time reading D, but just for certainty. Hours worked for each employee. Well, again, that's internal. So that should have been a very easy one. Uh, next one, number eight. Oh, it's one of these. Which of the above statements is or are correct? C. Uses material B, which has a current market price of 80 cents a kilo. In a linear programme where the objective is to maximise profit, the shadow price is $2 a kilo. So the market price is 80. The shadow price is $2. Which of the following statements are correct? Number one, contribution will be increased by $2 for each additional kilo purchased at the current market price. Well, hopefully you've been through linear programming and shadow prices. The answer to that is yes. That's how we work out the shadow price. Uh, if there's one extra kilo, how much extra contribution will we make? Number two, the maximum price which should be paid for an additional kilo is $2, no. The shadow price, it's the most extra you're prepared to pay for an extra kilo. So in fact, you're currently paying 80, you're prepared to pay an extra $2. The most you'll pay is in fact $2.80, not $2. Uh, number three. Contribution will be increased by 120 for each additional kilo purchased. And uh, no, I mean, we've already said for number one, the contribution it will be increased by $2, the shadow price. And finally, number four, the maximum price to pay is $2.80. Well, I've dealt with that earlier. The answer is yes. The $2 is the most extra you'll pay over and above what you're currently paying. So number four is true. So the answer, one and four, the answer is D. Number nine, what is the return per hour for product A? And it says X uses a throughput accounting system. Details of product A are as follows. Selling price, material costs, conversion costs, time on bottleneck resource. Well, the return per hour, the throughput return to per hour, the throughput itself, Uh, effectively contribution, but remember, with throughput accounting, we assume all costs are fixed apart from materials. So the selling price 320 less the materials of 80. The throughput is 240 per unit. For the return per hour, well, we divide by the time for each unit. The time for each unit. It's six minutes. I don't know, a lot of people seem to get upset over this, but there are 60 minutes in an hour. So six minutes is 0.1 of an hour. And so the throughput return per hour, 240 divided by 0.1 is 
is 2,400 per hour. And hopefully that's right. Yes, it is. Uh, the answer, therefore, is B. Number 10. What is the return on capital employed for the company? It says the following ratios have been calculated. Well, this is something you must have learned, or if you haven't, you must learn. It's one of the most standard uses of ratios of all. The return on capital employed is equal to the asset turnover times the operating profit margin. I said a minute ago, if you've not been through your ratios and you've not learned that, clearly you must. If you have learned it, then this really is one of the fastest questions on the paper. The asset turnover, 65%. Operating profit margin, 28%. And therefore, the uh, turn on capital employed, 18.2%, uh, which is B. So really no excuse at all uh, for not getting that 